Good morning and welcome all of you. Thank you for choosing to be at this panel. I know there are parallel sessions going on, but all of you chose to come here while we are competing with a Bollywood Hollywood panel parallelly going on and some sports thing going on. So really appreciate uh, you being I'm here. here. <laughs> We're going to talk about more serious stuff, you know, about social impact, making the world a better place. So you've, you've chosen the right place to be here. Uh, we have a, an amazing panel, as you've seen some of the bios of our panelists here, and we'll go around uh, with the introductions in, in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to set just a little bit of uh, context here uh, before we get started, and also uh, just a bit of logistics. Uh, we will, at the end of the session, uh, we will have Q&A for audience, and if you have the IIT app downloaded on your, on your mobile phone, uh, there is a place to go in uh, under programs, and then you can ask questions from there. So you can punch in your questions, and then we'll be reading out over here. Um, so the, the title of this, this conversation, this discussion here this morning, is about people helping people in an interconnected world. It's a very transformative uh, and impactful topic because the model that we have seen in the past several hundred years about a centralized model where whether governments or some large philanthropic organizations uh, coming together and trying to help the world in a trickle-down effect, that has not proved to be scalable. And the, the, the folks here uh, on, the, on the panel, they have been working on some very revolutionary you know, new models uh, enabled by technology as a tool to bring that change and impact. And you're going to hear directly from them uh, doing some world-class, uh, unbelievable, amazing things that they have been working on. The, the focus of this conversation, because obviously people helping people, you can have an impact in many areas. But we're going to focus on four areas where you know, there has been some profound impact done by folks right here that we have access to. Social justice, human empowerment, disaster and uh, emergency response, and poverty alleviation. Right? All these four major problems and crises as, you know, of humanity, we would try to solve you know, through governments, and as I mentioned, organizations, it has not been solved effectively. We still have two and a half billion people on the planet which are uh, under the, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, living under you know, $2 per day. So, we are going to see here those, you know, how technology is the tool, uh, as a transformative tool, to make scalable change happen. And I have uh, personally worked with some of the panelists here, so just to give quick context, uh, my name is Carl Mehta. I'm the founder and CEO of EdCast, which is an online and mobile education company. But in my side, uh, in my leisure time, I also work on a nonprofit, Code for, Code for India, which is people helping people on coding, and another organization with, that we founded, Skill Up India. Uh, while prior to that, when I was at the White House, I worked with Pete on a crisis, uh, the Sandy Storm, and Pete is with uh, Google, and he'll talk about it. But that was my first time experience about how people help people uh, in an emergency response. Uh, been working on a book on financial inclusion at the bottom of the pyramid and had the opportunity to work with Premal, um, and on, on Kiva and how they've been transforming it, so you're going to hear about that. So we are, we are seeing all this, this sharing technologies, this peer-to-peer -peer coming from many, many different angles and helping to solve these really, really big problems. So with that, um, I will uh, request, uh, you know, we'll go around uh, with the panelists. Uh, let them introduce themselves, we'll then jump into the questions, and then uh, would love to hear, try to make it as much interactive as possible, and please keep your questions ready. So with that, Will, we'll start with you, and then we, uh, we go from there. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Um, my name is Wael Gonem. I, um, I used to work at Google in 2008, and on my leisure time, I happened to become an accidental activist. Uh, after the death of... Um, uh, of an Egyptian guy in the streets of Alexandria in 2010. Um, I got really um, hooked up to uh, there got to be a way to change the, sit the political situation in the country. And uh, I started kind of a, a page that accidentally became a movement uh, on the internet with over 500,000 people uh, who are actively engaged. Uh, we ended up announcing a date for going in the streets after the Tunisians threw down uh, their president, um, and um, a lot of people went actually to the streets. And in 18 days, Mubarak was uh, forced out of power. Uh, now, uh, after the events that happened, the military coup that happened in 2013, I'm here working on um, another 
concept of a social network that tries and learn from the lessons I have seen in the past few years. Um, and I'm married and I have two kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, my name is Vijay Pandey. I'm a professor at Stanford University and also uh, do venture capital at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, I'm probably best known for my work with Folding at Home. I'm the director and founding director of the Folding at Home Distributed Computing Project. What Folding at Home is is that we actually have gotten over the last 15 years over 10 million people to get together and donate computer time to create the world's most powerful supercomputer. And we do calculations that really literally could not be done any other way, especially in areas of, in, of fighting disease and in healthcare. And over those last 15 years, it's developed um, a lot of advancements in fundamental science, but also a new insight into, into drugs for certain uh, diseases, especially one of the areas that we're especially interested in is infectious disease. And I, our new cures for diseases like dengue fever could potentially save 100,000 lives a year in Asia. Um, uh, having sort of gone from the academic side to the company side, uh, I've gotten very interested in the business world as well, and I'm leading the biology investments and in Horowitz right now, a uh, venture capital uh, firm on Sand Hill here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Premal, and uh, uh, in the mid 70s, my parents immigrated from uh, Gujarat, uh, India, to uh, Minneapolis. I'm not sure why my dad picked the coldest state uh, in the country, one of the coldest states. But uh, on my first trip back when I was five years old, uh, you know, I got to meet my grandparents, and my mom took me on the back of a moped, and it was incredible. I got to eat ice cream every day, which was uncharacteristic. But I also witnessed um, the injustice and the destitution, uh, the the um, the inequality uh, around the planet. Uh, and uh, it really moved me, and I'm sure for a lot of us, uh, you know, it's moved us. Uh, we feel like we're winners of the birth lottery uh, just by being in this room. And um, several years later, I was uh, working at PayPal, uh, and PayPal allows you to send money to, you know, uh, at the time, uh, in the early days, PayPal really got traction on eBay making uh, commerce with strangers safe, allowing you to buy maybe a television or a Beanie Baby from some stranger in Kansas and send them money via your credit card and, and protect you that way. And on a trip back to India on one of my vacations, uh, I was uh, volunteering at this NGO in Gujarat, and um, I was trying to help these women who was do, uh, doing kind of um, uh, you know, uh, s small uh, uh, handicraft goods, uh, lift them, list them on eBay, but when I found out that they were taking loans from uh, informal money lenders with very high interest rates, I was wondering, well, could you use the eBay platform or PayPal to PayPal them a microloan? Um, and the early experiment in trying to get that work to work was actually quite challenging, but uh, later joined up with a few other people to help found Kiva, which is an online platform that allows you to invest in a low-income entrepreneur in over 90 countries. Um, you're not donating your money, you're making a loan, and uh, you can help finance, for example, a rickshaw driver uh, in uh, Bombay uh, so that they can own their rickshaw. Um, and then as they pay off that loan, as their business is successful, you and other people who have crowdfunded his or her loan uh, get repaid, and you can turn around and recycle your $25 or $100 into another uh, micro-entrepreneur or farmer or even student uh, around the planet. Um, since launching nearly 10 years ago, uh, over a one million small businesses now have received financing on the website. Three out of four of them are women-run small businesses, uh, and the repayment rate is 98% on $750 million lent through the system. Thank you. Cool. Um, I'm Pete, also from Minneapolis. Um, I'm on the uh, Google Crisis Response Team. Um, the crisis, uh, the crisis response team leads Google's response to major disasters. Uh, since uh, the formation of the team, uh, in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, we've responded to over 50 major <coughs> uh, natural disasters around the world. Uh, our team also, uh, you know, with a focus on saving lives, our team also uh, provides early warning information alerts uh, to users. Uh, so taking official information, tornado warnings, flood watches, and pushing those out to users worldwide, including most recently uh, IMD alerts uh, for India. Um, and uh, since 2010, I've really kind of seen the maturation of the kind of crowdsourcing uh, community in times of uh, crisis, uh, which has been really kind of interesting to see. So I'm excited to, to talk about that with you guys today. 
Thank you. So let's take a quick survey of the audience here. How many of you are involved in a nonprofit organization or social impact? Pretty much most of you. That's why you're all here. And how many of you have used some kind of a crowdsourced, crowdfunded, peer-to-peer -peer capability to scale your mission, your work? Good. Well, we're going to learn a lot from this gentleman because as you see, the common theme here is that they have really leveraged those new models of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, and we're going to talk more about it. So um, I'll, I'll throw, start off with a question about you know, the, the general trend that all of us are involved with using internet as a tool. We are trying to strengthen the weak ties between people around the world who have a common interest. Right? So people who are interested in social justice and how do we bring them together on internet and create some kind of a movement to help solve a problem, or people who are interested in helping the bottom of the pyramid and give them some microfinancing. But the fundamental theme, if you just look at it at the very bottom, is this ability to connect strangers, complete strangers, but they do have a common interest, and we have today the tools and the technologies to connect them. So uh, I'll throw out, and you know, I would love to hear from all of you, from, because you all work in a diverse areas, that you know, what kind of tools, technologies that you've used today to strengthen that th those ties, and where do you see it going? Because I'm sure everyone in the audience here would love to use those kinds of tools and technologies to scale their mission, their work. Uh, whoever wants to go first, or, or we can go in order. <laughs> okay, I can start. So um, the reason why I personally got interested in politics was back in 2010, um, uh, Egyptians started using Facebook for, um, to discuss their the political situation in the country and to uh, communicate their frustration. It was very interesting because at the time, um, most of the people were not like, everybody said there is no hope, it doesn't, doesn't look like we could actually change this government, it's their country, and all these kind of narratives that if you have lived in an autocratic regime, you would probably uh, be familiar with. But the one interesting thing that was personally for me was changing this was the fact that I looked, um, uh, Al -Baradei, Muhammad Al Baradei, one of the opposition leadership came out and said that he's thinking about running as a president after uh, leaving his UN um, uh, role. And a group was created, that group um, simply calling for Al Baradei to be a president in 2013. And I looked at that group, it had about 10,000 people at the time I started spotting some of my friends or some of the familiar faces that I probably have seen before, buddies from school, and I was like, what, what is going on? A few days later, the 10,000 became 20,000, 30, until it became 200,000 people. And that was an eye-opener for me. Um, uh, as someone that really cares about the country, that walks on the street, not really happy with the fact that I have not seen a president uh, a new president since I was born, and I was about 30 years at a time. Um, so uh, the power of weak ties is, is amazing and enormous. It just helps us to start thinking about change in a way that have, we have never witnessed before. And in 2001 or 2002, no one would have thought about, okay, Egyptians are going to unite those who don't know each other are gonna go to the street in a life-threatening experience, willing to do that with strangers that they probably don't know, um, using an anonymous call from someone no one has, you know, no one knew who, who that was at the time. Um, and it all happened because of the, the importance and the use of technology, and also because the regime were, were not able to use that technology. So um, I think it's essential to think about how to strengthen weak ties. Ma Malcolm Gladwell had, um, had a whole theory about revolutions are not tweeted, and he was very um, uh, pessimistic about the concept of weak ties and how internet could actually strengthen those ties. But with models like Kiva, uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak on behalf of you, but I'm a big fan of Kiva, and on, with models like Kiva, weak ties actually work. Someone in the US would probably change the life of someone living in Africa or in Asia uh, without even knowing them. And uh, it was exactly the same thing when it comes to our experience for social justice. Yeah, it's interesting to think about two key trends that have happened. I think 
uh, in my mind, there's three periods of time to talk about. One is pre-internet, and then the time in between internet and mobile, and now post-mobile. Mm -hmm. So pre-internet, imagine like what we'd have to do if like a million people want to communicate. Uh, you can't get on the phone and communicate to a million people. You can't call up a million people. You can start dialing random numbers in the phone book in principle, but uh, you know it's just not scalable. Um, or you could, let's say, put an ad in the classified or something like that, and that could reach a lot of people. But that has a lot of friction and it's really slow. The internet really changed that because now you can actually uh, post uh, on a forum or you can, you can reach many, many, many people. But actually, it's a funny thing about human nature is that uh, the ability to do something doesn't mean that people will. And so what's the difference between sort of post-internet and post-mobile is that mobile devices really reduce the friction to zero. You know, imagine something like Uber, you could work that with just a laptop in principle. You could go to your, uh, go back home and t type into your laptop what you want to do. But the fact that the friction has been reduced to zero almost with mobile makes it almost a sort of magical experience. It makes it really easy, and so people will do it. And I think the technologies that we have right now have been layering on top of each other. M mobile on top of internet means that, m the internet means many, many people can talk to each other very easily, or talk to each other, and then mobile means it's actually easy and frictionless. And so I think the combination of these two things will have a huge impact, especially um, in a uh, sort, of, uh, sort of developing world, because there, mobile can jump ahead of things, where you could have a $49 cell phone, which is now being sold, a $49 smartphone, in fact can do all these types of things, and you don't even have to have bought a laptop, which is considerably more expensive. So in terms of technologies, we're actually at a pretty exciting time. And the question is, what are people going to do with it? And I think, I think people here and, and also many other entrepreneurs and, and uh, innovators are, are pushing these technologies. Uh, what, I, I'm, what I'm particularly excited about is that the internet and mobile helps communications, but it's the organization and the logistics that's the real challenge. And you think about other technologies that are impressive, like you think about FedEx. You know, when FedEx first came out, the ability to send something to someone else in a day was really amazing. But the way FedEx works is that everything comes to a central location and then comes back out. So if I FedEx someone uh, that's my neighbor, that letter goes all the way uh, to the central country, the middle of the country, then comes back out. But peer-to-peer -peer is just a logistical mess. That's something you, FedEx could never do. Um, but, you know, Amazon uh, is doing next day shipping in very creative ways and is not doing sort of the FedEx model. And drones and other things will involve peer-to-peer. -peer. And all these things happen with logistics and with computer logistics arranging everything. And so I think what we're going to start to see is peer-to-peer -peer will be enabled not because people haven't wanted to help, but that there just wasn't the ability to do this. And that computational methods uh, can really sort of transform what we can do. And so I, it's, I'm very excited. I think the future will be full of these types of things. I want to build on uh, Vijay's point around uh, mobile, uh, taking the friction out of things. I think one of the most exciting things when it comes to um, access uh, to finance uh, for the world's working poor is mobile payments. And um, I think the most successful example of mobile payments taking hold is in Kenya. Uh, if this room were the country of Kenya, 40 million people, everyone from right here to here you all would be rural subsistence farmers. And to reach you to provide access to savings, education, logistics, uh, a credit loan for, so you can buy seeds for your, for, for, for your next uh, planting season is very costly. And that's why the interest rates in microfinance can be very high. It's literally bankers on mopeds coming all the way out to your rural village. But with mobile payments, which now in Kenya, there is a system called M-Pesa. How many of you have heard of M-Pesa? It's incredible. It was an economist cover story a couple of years ago. Three out of four Kenyan adults use it actively. I've read anywhere between 5 to 20% of the value of the GDP is being transacted annually through the system. And it basically allows me to send money to Vijay. Vijay can send money to uh, Whale. Uh, and then Whale can go to a local uh, gas station and pull the money out in Kenyan shillings using his mobile phone. Uh, it's pretty incredible. And it's brought the cost of reaching you all down to near zero directly so that when you land from Des Moines, Iowa, or here from San Francisco to someone in Kenya, it goes right to her on her phone. And one microfinance borrower, uh, it's not just lower cost, but she said, look, my husband may try to break into my phone, but he'll never get the money off my SIM card. So it's not just lower cost, but it's also a sense of control and agency 
for those people oftentimes who don't have power within the household to be able to control their own money. Mobile payments, I think, is just profound. And you know, there's so many other kind of uh, applications that can be built upon uh, everyone having access to one of these. Uh, we're very, very excited about, uh, about that trend in particular. I would say um, also on the kind of uh, disaster response side, uh, just you know, everyone having mobile phones, it's just all of this kind of situational awareness coming online. Uh, and the kind of wonderful challenge is, how do you connect that one person that knows uh, that there's emergency supplies at this location or that this evacuation route is clear? Um, how do you connect them with the other people that aren't necessarily connected to that person? Uh, and it's, it's kind of this, this challenge of the, the needle in the haystack where you have people communicating. Um, they're using the tools that they already like, know. They, they're using Facebook and they're using Twitter. Uh, they're on Uber. Uh, and for us, it's how do we bring all of that together? Um, how do you connect someone from one network uh, and another network? And just what is that single kind of forum for them to kind of understand all of this? So on the kind of crisis response side, uh, we've been really lucky to work with Twitter, uh, to work with a number of other kind of um, uh, crowdsourcing organizations um, so that when disaster does happen and when early warnings are going out, when there is a cyclone warning, we're able to kind of integrate a lot of this information and provide a kind of common uh, operating uh, picture for people to say, Hey, you know, people, uh, one great example is uh, tornado warnings in the Midwest. You know, people like to take photos of a funnel, uh, funnel cloud coming down. Like, we will give you a notification on your phone to tell you, hey, there's a, you know, tornado watch or warning, or a tornado was actually happening. And then including information from the crowd, like a photo, really kind of makes it real. It's your neighbors that are posting this. And it really kind of inspires you to kind of take the right action uh, you know, potentially when lives are at stake. So I think, you know, everyone is, you know, everyone has a phone, everyone has sensors, cameras. Uh, it's just, it's a great, great resource uh, for, for those that are, you know, helping and, and wanting to save lives. So I've seen this in real life uh, when the Sandy Storm hit New York. I was working with Pete and I had a team at the White House. I was working there and we very quickly within like few hours assembled a team of kids in New York, New Jersey area and they were using their smartphones taking pictures of gas stations and updating back real time with Pete's uh, team, uh, 24X7 on the maps, showing which gas station has gas, which gas station has power, which one has gas but no power, which one has power but no gas. Mm -hmm. And that kind of information can't be done without a crowdsourced volunteer base who is willing to just fluidly jump into it, has the power of technology connected back to a centralized organization. But now that brings to an, another converse question, which is all of you talked about that how you have built a very successful, scalable, peer-to-peer -peer model that, that scales and works. So how about the other extreme? Do you guys think that the centralized model is gonna go away and everything, you know, we've gone through in the computer industry so many times the cycles of central versus distributed computing. This is the first time we are seeing this wave in the nonprofit and the impact world where we can actually give the power to the people and run it just completely people to people. And this could be the utopia of democracy where it really becomes that the people are solving the social justice issue, the people are solving the poverty issue. And it's not the government where they take our taxpayer money, they put it into this big pot there, and then they try to distribute wealth, and we all know that how inefficient it is, how much corrupted it is, right? So this technology and the, and the models that these folks have proven in their own area can be, can be virtually applied to almost any areas of you know, humanity where we need to bring you know, health, sanitation, education, all of them. So I want to hear some radical views, not like take some really radical thing, like do, you, do we really need governments? Do we really need even nonprofit organizations like, you know, I mean, Gates does a great job of giving away billions of dollars, but do we need that old philanthropic model of some rich guy or a bunch of rich people write a check every year as a donor. I, I do that all the time with a bunch of my charities, but I don't know whether that model works or not. It's been around for a few hundred years. We haven't really solved the poverty problem. Um, I don't know whether if we can get even 10 Gates foundations out there giving away $5 billion a year, that's not gonna solve almost like 3 billion people who are still at the bottom of the pyramid. I am a firm believer of this model, this revolutionaries and innovators who have created this bottoms up peer to peer model, but I want to hear from all of you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll just dive in maybe just quickly. Is that uh, I am a huge fan of, of small organizations. I think uh, whether we're talking about a startup or a university sort of research team, 
And it's you know, well shown that small organizations can move very quickly and fail very quickly and do quite a bit. And as you get to larger organizations, whether we're talking about a charity, a large corporation, or a government, uh, there, it's hard to avoid inefficiencies at that type of scale. It's essentially unavoidable. And so I think what's exciting about this, and we see some examples here, is that peer-to-peer -peer interactions allow um, small groups of people to interact with other small groups uh, in, a, in a very vibrant way, in a way that just wasn't possible before. And so um, while maybe government still has some uses, I think uh, this is an area where I think um, one can do much better. Okay. Will? I, I see a very kind of mutualistic uh, relationship. So um, I think they're, they're very complementary in terms of the crowd and, and governments, um, especially uh, with respect to crisis response. So. Uh, what we see is like governments, you know, they have jurisdiction over certain areas, certain kinds of data and information. Uh, when disaster strikes, uh, you know, things are, you know, things become very chaotic. And kind of expertise, uh, you know, it just expertise goes down to the really local level. It's the people that are affected, the people that uh, are on the ground. They have the real, um, you know, expertise and understanding. Uh, and what I see time and again is that uh, you kind of start with official information. Think like road data uh, that the governments are producing and maintaining. Uh, you know, when an earthquake happens, when a hurricane strikes, uh, you know, that information is immediately kind of out of date. And, uh, you know, the people that know that are the ones that are, you know, again, on the ground and, and kind of making updates and contributions. And that, uh, you know, that um, relationship, that, um, that virtuous cycle is that uh, you start with the official data, um, it goes down to the crowd, and over time, uh, you know, it becomes this virtuous cycle where the unofficial data becomes the official data, where the governments are taking advantage of the kind of crowdsourced information. A really good example is in 2010 for the uh, Haiti earthquake, um, they, uh, they, um, there was a, a crowdsourcing platform called Ushahidi, uh, which uh, incorporated crowd reports, so users were able to text in and say, uh, you know, this area, um, you know, there's someone that needs rescuing here, uh, there's rubble here, and, uh, you know, that information uh, was being uh, transmitted in Creole. It was being translated uh, by the uh, diaspora around the world. Uh, and the U.S. Marine Corps ended up using that information to dispatch helicopters and actually, like, saving lives based on that. And that became, like, their official, uh, you know, it became part of the official playbook for them uh, is, like, where are things happening while well, that expertise is on the ground. Uh, and so that's, I think, the relationship between the official, uh, you know, the official, like the government. They have the resources, they have the expertise, uh, the institutional knowledge, uh, but it's a real partnership when disaster happens to so take advantage of that kind of crowdsource data and then make that, um, you know, kind of bless that and imbue that with the trust of the government and, and act upon it. Will? So uh, I think there, there has been a lot of uh, speculations about what, what the future is going to look like when it comes to the new power structures and the old power structures. Uh, old power structures are very managerial. Uh, there are rules and regulations that govern all relationships. And um, it's, it's kind of like currency. A few people would own a big part of the power, and, and the rest are just like users on, under the, the rules uh, of, of those few. And the new power structures are much more disruptive. They are peer-to-peer. -peer. They are based on collaboration. Um, there is uh, Jeremy Hyman's call it the current versus the currency. So the currency is the old, uh, old structure, and the current is, is the new structure. Um, and I do agree that it's, it's not mutually exclusive. There, there will be some sort of an evolution, because we do, need, uh, we do need governments, probably not in the same way as it is right now. What, um, what I've been reading and interested in, um, in in the past few years is like there must be an, a new political system that should work and and you know evolve from the the power of technology. Why do we have to wait for two years, sometimes four years, some in other some other countries, thirty years, um, before we can change a politician? Or why do we have to delegate? Um, why would I give my vote to the politician for one time for uh, for the past? for the next three years or four years. Why not case by case basis? All these challenges, and there has been like trials and trials to uh, disrupt politics. So if you, um, if you ask me what, would, what I would love to see versus uh, what I think is gonna happen, I, I would love to see more models of uh, liquid democracy happening in the world where uh, there, there are real disruption, uh, disruptions in the way um, we as humans are making decisions for our countries or our groups.
Fre um, Fremel. Uh, uh, if you guys haven't checked out uh, the concept of liquid democracy, which Whale just mentioned, I think it's just absolutely fascinating, which is one thing that, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, so in the case of Kiva, we're a crowdfunding platform, and uh, most of our work is international. And uh, here in the U.S., a part of our taxpayer dollars goes to foreign aid through the USAID. Uh, and where I see, you know, uh, to use Pete's term, uh, government complementing the crowds is all money going from U.S. taxpayers and therefore really gates and other foundations that have a noble cause should I think be done in a very transparent way on crowdfunding platforms because that way they could signal to each one of us where their experts think there's the greatest impact per dollar and then we can actually come in and lend, on, lend or donate on top of that and in a more transparent way even with the failures you know, we're all going to learn together. But right now what's happening is there's huge disbursements done from either, you know, foundations or USAID um, that the American taxpayer, the American public, is very hard for us to really connect to. And I think there's a whole, um, the next 10 years we'll see a lot more transparency uh, around where that money's going, how we can also get involved. Um, and if we get involved in something, maybe those systems will actually pay attention to something that they might have overlooked. There's, there's all sorts of, I would say, mutual learning and mutual benefit from doing it on you know, one platform or a few platforms. Um, and, and, and I'd like to see it uh, be done in a much more transparent way. And then together, we're just going to be much more uh, impactful. Cool. So I was just informed that we have five minutes more, but I want to get some questions from the audience. But I would like to summarize quickly. Uh, yeah, we'll catch your questions, which is, you know, what I'm hopeful about and what I'm, you know, really excited about uh, hearing all this is that this new model is working, it's scaling, it's going to help us to make the government 2.0 or central organizations 2.0 more lean and bring more power to the people. So the more all of us take the power, organize ourselves into peer-to-peer -peer around, our around our causes, use technology to assemble an organization and make things happen, I think we are going to create a much more better world. So the technology exists. Outside of non-commercial, just quick point, right? Uh, quick points on the commercial side. You've seen that the trust in people to people is going all-time high, while the trust in the government is almost going all-time low, uh, low with, you know, with, with what's happening in the Greece and things like that. But you look at bitcoins, which is no central banks, no central organization, people trusting people in a general you know, ledger about where the money is. If you look at Uber and if you look at Airbnb, it's all people trusting people and working with each other. So we are seeing large-scale scalable, successful models of peer-to-peer -peer happening in the commercial sector, there's no reason that we can't use that same thing to scale the nonprofits, which I've always been very, very um, disheartened that nonprofits have not been able to scale to solve the problems that they, they would want to. So with that, I would love to take a few questions. Um, we have a, have you typed it or you want to just speak? Go ahead. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, the question is basically, can we use uh, local expertise to do better kind of resilience? So better kind of um, uh, uh, just better preparing users or keeping uh, best practices for um, you know getting for staying you know out of a floodplain or uh, like how do you uh, basically preparedness? Uh, how do you scale preparedness for people and, and share those best practices? And uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I think part of it is, uh, you know, just a lot of people don't know that they're living, uh, you know, in these kind of risky environments. Um, I think a lot of that information, in the U.S., there's floodplain data that, you know, FEMA puts out that is just, it's in GIS formats that, you know, the lay public just does not have access to. Uh, in India, you know, there's, you know, there's some of this risk information, but it's really hard to get if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't have a, you know, GIS expertise. Uh, and I think for us, it's, um, you know, it's really kind of communicating that risk uh, to users, especially in a format, like a format that's like suitable for a future phone. Um, and, you know, just saying, hey, uh, you know, this, this kind of location is very susceptible, uh, you know, to flooding risk. Uh, and kind of making more actionable what the kind of risks are at that location. And then marrying that with the early warning information uh, to say, this is a risky location. Um, and then, you know, kind of using the instincts of users and past experience to say, again, on the preparedness side, like, you know, the, the rainfall and flooding would be like two years worse or like two inches more than it was two years ago. Uh, and just giving, giving them some of that, uh, that past context and sharing that with other users also. Um, uh, 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 so 
Sorry, uh, I want to quickly get one more question before we end. This is a really good question, and I think, uh, how do you, so this is uh, someone typed it here, getting votes. How do you create the initial critical mass of participants? Really good question, because I think it's great to have a movement and all of that and make it happen, but the fundamental thing is, that, how do you get that initial mass of participants? Um, I, th I think I could take that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think there are key key things here. First is that there has to be um, a goal, like there has to be a purpose, and a few number of people um, has to be wild enough and blunt enough to communicate that purpose to whomever that would join um, join the initial set of the movement. And the second um, is actually lowering the cost for entry. So um, the the way we uh, the way it's, things started on on the Facebook page experience was that. Um, I created the page on following the day when the, the news flew that the, that the, the, the young guy died. Um, about 100,000 people joined in the very first few days. And the reasons were, number one, uh, the name was very communicative and, um, and emotional. And, and it was kind of connecting with people about the cause. We are all Khalid Said. We're all that guy we would die the same way. And the reason actually I created that page was that I saw another page by, created by an activist that was very angry page. Um, and um, he had like a, a fo profile photo of uh, the guy and then wrote a message under it, we're gonna get you back, you dogs of the regime. And I felt there must be a better language to get more people into this movement. And we started, um, I, I was joined by someone else, and we started thinking about what could we do. Initially, we started by, as I mentioned, like common goal. Second was lowering the cost of uh, involvement, and this is I can I cannot take credit for that. This is Facebook. It's just a simple like on a page. It doesn't really um, cost anything. And then third is like by thinking of this as a funnel, which which is. First, you have to get people invested in a way or another. They have to do something beyond that one like uh, that makes them really cares about your goal. And that has to be also very small. And it, and it would be taking, you know, it would be growing gradually. Uh, the first engagement has to be um, take a photo of yourself and uh, tell people that you care about this cause. A lot of people would, would probably take, do that if it's not risky. Uh, but if you ask them on the first engagement, uh, we'll go to the street and protest, and you're probably going to be arrested. Um, much less number of people are going to be willing to do that. Um, and now the idea is like to, to basically put them on kind of an, a hierarchy of actions, um, get them invested in these actions. I could say that easily right now, but this is pretty much what happened uh, during the events, and it were, were organically happening. We never called for a street pro protest until uh, January 25th. Um, all the actions before that were very, um, um, very like normal actions, very small actions. One of them, the first one to go to the street was like a silent stand where we wear black and we stand up in the street for one hour, not protesting, not saying anything. That was also quite easy versus if you ask people to go and protest um, in front of the Ministry of Internal uh, Interior Affairs because a lot of people will be scared to do that. Um, so the bottom line of this is one, there must be a, a clearly communicative purpose. Um, a few people who are courageous enough to uh, stand up for that and um, act as the honeypot for all, all others. Three is there has to be very low cost to barrier to very low barrier to entry. And four, there has to be some sort of a funnel where you could get people invested one uh, one step after another. Um, and that's I, I think that would be my uh, my advice. And I think probably you would have share some of these because in Kiva you 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 somehow have that model. Well, uh, that's a great answer. Thank you. But uh, unfortunately, I was signaled that our time is up. Uh, but a few things. Number one, uh, the, the panelists will be here. Uh, please uh, talk to them. I know there's some really good questions here. Uh, one of my favorite questions here that I'm, I'm sure all of you have, because all of you are working on any kind of a social mission, social impact, is how do you get funding for your social entrepreneurship project? And because money is the first thing that you need, uh, I, I wish that we would have uh, got into that, but we'll, we'll get you answers. And I want to thank the panelists uh, for the time. So let's give a round of applause to the panelists. And uh, I think we have some token uh, uh, gift for you. Uh, so thanks for that. So we'll be around and uh, want to take a group picture. Okay, all right.
So thank you everyone for attending and uh, please keep in touch uh, through this Q&A or just uh, tweet to us. Uh, I'm at uh, Carl Mehta, but you can find the Twitter handles for all our panelists and uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer over, uh, over uh, Twitter. Thank you.